Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. The 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics has been awarded to three scientists for their contributions to the so-called observation of gravitational waves. In February of last year, a team working with the LIGO gravitational wave detector announced their discovery. We are told that the instruments detected, quote, ripples in space-time, which were caused by the collision of two black holes a billion years ago. This was not the first time such a pronouncement of gravitational waves discovery produced a media firestorm, although the previous claims were later disconfirmed. However, institutional science and science media unite in consensus that the discovery is valid and marks an irrefutable confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Is the purported detection of gravitational waves actually valid? In part one of this two-part presentation, our chief science advisor, physicist Wal Thornhill, again tackles the question, and he suggests why the signals cannot, in fact, have anything to do with gravity. The 2017 Nobel Prize for Physics has been awarded once again to mathematicians. This time, it's for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. It seems the inmates are in charge of the asylum. Last month at the Royal Institution, Dr Jim Baggett, an award-winning science author, lectured on the concept of mass, which is essential for understanding gravity. He declared that theoretical physicists have a dirty little secret. He explained... The mission of a theoretical physicist trying to work out the nature of substance and elementary particles is to get the maths to work out correctly and consistent with what's gone on before. So we're discussing mathematics, not physics. And, of course, what's gone on before is that mathematicians raised Einstein's general relativity to the status of scripture while that theory ignores the substance of stars and planets that exhibit mass and gravity. So the theory has no physical basis whatsoever. It depends instead on a warped view of reality. Unsurprisingly, Jim Baggett failed to physically define mass or explain the mysterious equivalence of inertial mass and gravitational mass. The dirty little secret is that mathematics is the foreign language of physics. Few claim to understand the language, and the math to English dictionary is woefully incomplete because the editors, the natural philosophers, were sacked a century ago. So key words like mass and energy are physically undefined, and infinities are reified, which allows a photon to exist having no mass but carrying energy. The shocking truth is that E equals mc squared is not physically understood. It seems physics is a foreign discipline for mathematicians also. Phys.org asks, what is space-time? And answers, space-time is the mind-bending, four-dimensional way astronomers see the universe. It melds the one-way march of time with the more familiar three dimensions of space. But how can astronomers see anything in four dimensions? And point me in the direction that time is marching. Lumping together the concept of locations in three dimensions, that is space, with the numbers on clocks, that is time, cannot constitute a physical fabric. Space-time is a meaningless concatenation of words. It isn't physics. As a result, translations of theoretical mathematics into plain English have become meaningless New Age nonsense. Mathematics isn't physics. When it comes to experiment, how can our prize winners claim an infinitesimal signal is a hypothetical gravitational effect allegedly caused by objects, black holes, that have never been observed. How can our prize winners be so specific about the masses of two merging black holes? A black hole has never been observed. If a theorist is unable to discover real objects, which cause the observed effects, it is unscientific, indeed it is fraudulent, to invent unreal objects and present them as a factual discovery of the cause of those effects. Gravitational waves and black holes are merely mathematical speculations with fatal problems, which I'll address in a moment. And how can you have decisive contributions 
from a detector when the effect is a displacement of less than the width of a proton over 4 kilometres. The experiment is a textbook example of pathological science. Matching signal patterns from a huge database of 250,000 theoretical templates of alleged binary black hole collisions, hoping one might coincide with the infinitesimal recorded signals. Critical to the detection algorithm is that the alleged gravitational waves are assumed to travel at the speed of light. So there is a time delay expected between similar signal patterns from separate LIGO detectors. But Newton's theory, which is used successfully to navigate the solar system, has gravity operating instantly. Time doesn't appear in his law of gravity. Newton's gravity acts like a rigid rod between celestial bodies, where the tug at one end is felt immediately at the other end. This is actually essential for the clockwork regularity of the planetary system, but it's never considered because the effect exceeds Einstein's speed limit of light waves. What light has to do with the force of gravity is not explained. Meanwhile, the phys.org report states, Gravitational waves stretch space in one direction and compress it in a transverse direction. How Einstein's gravity, which does away with force, manages to allegedly stretch and compress a four-dimensional geometric concept of empty space is unexplained. The important thing to note is that the signals did not arrive at the same time in each LIGO detector, so the LIGO signals were not caused by gravity. More damning, though, is that the physical implications of black hole theory seem not to be understood by any academic. Steve Crothers addressed this issue in his Electric Universe 2017 presentation. Amongst other things, he points out that the black hole universe is infinite and not expanding, while the Big Bang universe is finite and expanding. The black hole universe is eternal, while the Big Bang universe is 13.8 billion years old. The black hole universe is asymptotically flat, while the Big Bang universe is not asymptotically anything. A black hole universe contains only one mass, while the Big Bang universe contains many masses. So we, as observers, cannot exist in a black hole universe, and two black holes orbiting each other in the Big Bang universe is impossible. Yet we are led to believe that four binary pairs of black holes have been positively identified and accurately weighed through vanishingly tiny chirp signals. To drive home the sheer nonsense of black hole theory, Steve itemises its properties. A black hole has finite mass concentrated at its singularity. The singularity has zero volume and infinite density. The black hole has no gravitational force, only space-time curvature. There is infinite curvature at the singularity, which means infinite gravity. Steve says, let's think about that. A finite mass is located in zero volume. It has infinite density. It has infinite gravity. Do you think any such thing exists? It's simply assumed by the originators of black hole gravitational collapse theory that matter is uncharged and infinitely compressible. It is also simply assumed that the gravitational equations and the universal constant of gravitation, g, are universal and can be applied inside the Earth and stars without change. There is no mention of the matter in those bodies, which is the origin of their mass and gravity. Meanwhile, their partners in mathematical fraud, particle theorists, have decided that normal matter has no intrinsic mass, which further obscures the origin of gravity and our understanding of the universe. It's a self-serving myth that Einstein's mathematics predicts black holes. The originators of black hole theory in 1965, including Thorne, chose not to mention that Einstein's October 1939 paper, which they refer to, concludes with the Schwarzschild singularity, the term black hole had not been introduced then, does not appear for the reason that matter cannot be concentrated arbitrarily, and this is due to the fact that otherwise the constituting particles would reach the velocity of light. Einstein showed mathematically that black holes cannot form gravitationally for the same reason that stars and planets cannot, because the infalling matter begins to circle the centre of mass until the centrifugal force balances the gravitational force. The observational evidence now shows that stars and planets are formed by the powerful electromagnetic force produced in electromagnetic pinches along cosmic lightning filaments in molecular clouds. Gravitational collapse theory 
is now discredited by direct observation. In the following episode, Thornhill suggests that a fundamental error of Einstein's has prevented scientists from considering a mundane explanation for the chirps LIGO has detected. And he explores in detail the promising theoretical alternatives that await in the electric universe. In part one of this presentation, physicist Wal Thornhill began his analysis of the recent award of the Nobel Prize in Physics to scientists for their contributions to the so-called detection of gravitational waves. While science media has shown exactly zero skepticism of the gravitational waves pronouncements, Thornhill discussed some of the foundational mathematical problems that preclude the claimed detection of quote, two black holes colliding and producing ripples in the fabric of space-time. Today, Thornhill explores another fundamental cosmological question, and that is the existence of the required medium for the communication of electromagnetic waves in the quote, vacuum of space, a medium called the ether. Physics used to be called natural philosophy in more scientifically productive centuries, so-called modern science is largely bootstrapped technology built on scientific principles that were around before Einstein. Einstein himself warned that pure mathematics cannot claim to be natural or philosophical, and at the end of his life expressed grave doubts that his work would endure. Meanwhile, his devotees raised him to sainthood, ignored his caution, and became mesmerised by their computer screens and chalkboards covered with inscrutable math symbols. Einstein was a dreamer who largely originated this century-old mathematical mess by imagining perception is reality. That's like saying of someone who is moving away from you that their space is shrinking and their watch is ticking more slowly. But relativity theory allows the departing person to say the same of you. Einstein, with his theory of relativity, removed absolute standards by making length and time rubbery and a matter of arbitrary choice of moving frames of reference which cannot be equivalent if we are to define energy and mass. Another fundamental error of Einstein's has prevented a more mundane explanation for the chirp signals from LIGO. Einstein discarded the medium for the transmission of waves in a vacuum, called the ether, which is essential for Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism and to explain the dielectric properties of the vacuum. It's impossible to wave nothing. Light must have an electrically polarizable medium, an ether. Having a universal medium discards Einstein's principle of the equivalence of inertial frames of reference and the constancy of the speed of light. Why is this important? Because the huge LIGO vacuum chambers are full of ether and the design assumes the speed of light to be a universal constant. Let's look at LIGO. Weiss devised the approach to gravitational wave detection in 1967, during lesson planning for a relativity course he was teaching at MIT, and I quote, You'd make a right triangle of objects floating freely in a vacuum, Weiss told his students, according to a 2000 interview, and we'd send light beams between them and then be able to figure it out. What does the gravitational wave do to the time it takes light to go between these things? Gravitational waves due to merging black holes definitely don't exist. Natural philosophy, physics suggests simply that a disturbance travelling through the ether inside the 4 kilometre LIGO arms may be one way to produce a chirp signal in the LIGO system. This raises serious questions for the future of science and the usefulness of prize-giving as a motivator. Weiss and Thorne are two of three physicists known as the Troika, the founders of LIGO's giant twin detectors in Livingston, Louisiana and in Hanford, Washington. The third Troika member, Ronald Drever, died on the 7th of March this year. Before Drever's passing in March, the Troika won the $3 million Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, the $500,000 Gruber Foundation Cosmology Prize, the $1.2 million Shaw Prize in Astronomy, and the $1 million Kavli Prize in Astrophysics. These and other Nobel Prize winners of the past have seriously warped our sense of reality. The public will have spent $1.1 billion providing super expensive gadgets to detect the grin of the cosmic Cheshire cat to mathematical gamers posing as physicists. Like the scientists wasting billions of euros on the Large Hadron Collider to find the imaginary Higgs boson, they had to find something to save their credibility. 
government-funded, institutionalised big science is not working in the 21st century. The rewards, the lack of critical scrutiny, trust us, we're the experts, and suppression of dissenting voices have to be seriously investigated because we are about to waste a great deal more money. It's reported that the European Space Agency is planning a multi-billion dollar probe to be launched in about 17 years that would look for gravitational waves from space. Weiss hopes astronomers will learn more about nuclear physics, states of matter, how heavy elements are made, and detect information from, and I quote, the very moment when the universe came out of nothingness. We expect surprises, he said. There has to be surprises. The real surprise is how anyone can claim to be a physicist and say the universe came out of nothingness. That isn't physics. One of the dissenting voices, Dr Harold Aspton, an outstanding British theoretical physicist, electrical engineer and inventor, wrote, Until the scientific world recovers its good sense and takes another look at the mysteries of our cosmos, with the ether in mind and Einstein ignored, we really have no hope of inspiring future science students and gaining a better understanding of the phenomena which dominate, indeed constitute, our very existence. The galling thing is that the electric universe already has a real model of how gravity works, and it answers simply most of the real questions. We are now testing some of these models experimentally. Perversely, it is found that government funding hinders innovation because research is concentrated on the current preoccupations of those who direct research grants. We rely not on the government but on benefactors and public donations. It's the Renaissance model of doing science. Research has found that science seems to follow the innovation, not the other way around. The practical tinkerers find something, then science is employed to work out why that's what we've found works. The Innovative Thunderbolts project is an outstanding example of this approach, with the distinguishing feature of having a coherent cosmology to direct the tinkerers. What hope is there for the future? History shows that paradigm shifts come from individuals, often from outside the affected discipline. Today, those in organisations that have access to science journals and the media, and who have the most to lose from a paradigm shift, suppress such claims or attempt to assimilate the ideas surreptitiously. Nobel Prizes have notoriously been awarded to those insiders who develop an outsider's idea. How can we find these innovators outside the academic system? Chris Reeve suggests in his online controversies in science, which I highly recommend, this is a world where we are dependent upon the experts for any announcement of our new paradigm. Yet the experts are the very people who stand to lose the most by such an announcement. He then asks the question, what would a paradigm change actually look like? And Chris answers, the correct answer is that, assuming you're not an actual academic, there's no real guarantee that you'd actually see our new paradigm emerging at all. If there was some exciting new scientific era just around the corner, we'd never know it. This, of course, applies to the electric universe paradigm. Chris then offers a solution through a science futures market where people can wager bets on well-crafted, specific, time-limited scientific predictions. Science futures markets have the potential to expose scientific dogma that's become embedded with science journalism. They can help us to identify impending paradigm changes as they reward those who are paying attention sufficiently to understand that the data is deviating from the carefully managed message we get from mainstream science. I wish such a market had been around decades ago, given the success of the many unique specific predictions of the electric universe when measured against the continual surprises for Big Bang cosmology. Instead of cramming heads with facts, we need documentation of science controversies, past and present, to be accessible to the public and teachers, so that students can be trained in critical thinking. So-called evidence-based science can then be seen to be special pleading. One scientist's fact can be another's fiction. That's the basis of debunking. Learning this together with the ideas, context and personalities involved in earlier science debates allows one to see what persuaded crucial verdicts in the past and to realise how often those decisions had little to do with the science and more to do with beliefs, politics and influence. Understanding those debates is also perhaps the best way to inspire anyone to participate in science criticism and discovery. 
There is so much data and so little understanding of that data. We must stop funding and rewarding the religious belief expressed by Galileo that mathematics is the language of God, that the mathematical mind can deduce the true laws of nature, that the mathematical mind alone would lead to true knowledge of reality. Until we do, science remains a religious belief system. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info.